Well everyone, Mike here with Haru Canucks and with the Ryzen 7000 series recently getting their prices cut, I guess indefinitely, they're actually becoming a lot more of a viable solution for a lot of people who are trying to build a new system right now. But there are still a ton, and I mean a ton, of concerns about the temperatures that these things operate at. I actually did a complete video covering the temperatures, clock speeds, and everything else. You can find that right up here. But this video, this video is really narrowing down things to the ITX market because I'm sure, like I said, with these prices coming down, a lot of people in the small form factor market are maybe looking to upgrade their systems with Ryzen 7000 series processors. But how do these things actually react when they're paired up with some of the most popular ITX coolers or small form factor coolers on the market right now? That is exactly what I wanted to find out. So I've assembled some of the absolute best of the best small form factor heat sinks around, and I'm testing them with not one CPU, not even two, but every single Ryzen 7000 series processor launched so far. Anyways, I actually wanted to start this video off with a little bit of sad news for a lot of you guys and some serious talk for those manufacturers because what ends up happening now with AM5 is that a lot of the most popular and some of the best small form factor coolers on the market don't even support the socket. And no, just because something supports AM4 does not necessarily mean that it supports AM5. Some of the good examples out there are the Alpenfin Black Ridge, Cryorig's entire small form factor lineup, and most of ID Cooling's ITX heatsinks too. So with that in mind, I guess I should narrow things down a bit. I'm testing the best low profile coolers we've benchmarked that are actually compatible with AMD's new socket. First of all is the best ultra low profile cooler. So something that's under the 40 millimeter mark, which is the Noctua L9A. Then there's the next step up with the IS55. It's by far the champion in the under 60 millimeter height bracket right now. I mean, if you can get over its memory clearance limitations, that is. And finally, there's the big boy of the bunch, the Scythe Big Shuriken 3 Revision B, which still sticks to under 70 millimeters of Z height, and it's just amazing in every possible way. And for the record, here's the approximate decibel readings each cooler reaches. This basically highlights every heatsink here is engineered to put silent operation before extreme performance. So keep that in mind as we go through the results, guys. So that sets the stage for the heat sinks. And I'm sure some of you guys are wondering exactly what did I test these things in? Because if we're testing small form factor coolers, there's no way they should be tested in an open test system or in an even ATX case. What I'm using for this is probably one of my favorite small form factor cases of all time, and that is the NATX. And speaking of testing, it's pretty straightforward. We're using an RTX 3080 Ti Founders Edition and an ROG Crosshair X670E Gene. All the coolers were run at 50% and 100% fan speed with a constant ambient room temperature of about 24 degrees. I also wanted to be fair to the realities within the SFF space, and that's because a lot of people in this market market are not going to be running the Ryzen 7000 series at their stock settings. Basically what they're gonna be doing is doing exactly what we tested with in addition to all the other tests. And that is setting PBO's curve optimizer to a minus 10 setting, which not only lowers the amount of heat that these processors produce, but it does so with basically no negative performance impact in a lot of situations. Come on, man, you gotta focus on this core. Okay, what is this core? Well, only the most pro of the P3s around. It is an open frame chassis to challenge all that dust in your space. TG to fight the fingerprints, a very important recessed motherboard side vent to accommodate all the difficult to get GPUs. We have new case feet for stability, new IO, and you get the joy of building it all yourself. Well, you are right. This is one of the best cores yet. The Core P3 TG Pro from Thermaltake. Don't forget the main. Check it out below. And for those of you who might not know about Precision Boost Overdrive, you can find it in its own dedicated section within your motherboard's BIOS. While Curve Optimizer is typically used for overclocking these CPUs, in this case, we're dialing things back a bit instead. Each step here is about five millivolts of reduction. So setting a minus 10 here reduces voltage by about 50 millivolts overall. On the flip side of that coin, that simply means that clock speeds and actual performance are gonna mean a hell of a lot more than any temperature metric when it comes to judging the value of any cooler 
on the Ryzen 7000 series. And that is especially true when it comes to gaming. Just keep that at the very forefront of your mind as we go through the results in the next couple of minutes. So the first thing I wanted to mention is that I'm adding the AK620 to these charts just to give you an idea of what a high-end air cooler can do when it's used on an open test bench. So basically, optimal results for air cooling. Anyways, at 50% fan speed and stock CPU settings, none of these ITX coolers here get to a worrying temperature level. But the L9A gets pretty toasty with low fan speeds and even with the PBO minus 10 setting on the optimizer curve. On the other hand, increasing fans to full speed pulls things down nicely, especially on the big Shuriken, which runs a good 10 to 11 degrees cooler than it did at 50% fan speeds. Moving on to frame rates and the Shuriken and IS55 have essentially the same results when running at 100% and the same goes for 50% too. Setting the optimizer curve to minus 10 doesn't hurt frame rates in this case, but it doesn't help either. But then there's the L9A and while the impact isn't huge, it seems like as you surpass 80 degrees in lightly threaded workloads like gaming, the 7600X's performance does get cut a bit since we're seeing a consistent frame rate drop off compared to the best results here. All core low temperatures on the other hand, well, this is where the small coolers will start struggling at lower fan speeds, with every single one of them hitting a constant 95 degrees. The only exception is the Shuriken that gets to 89 degrees with our curve optimizer reduction. Even at 100% fan speed, it's the only one to hit under 90 degrees without any adjustments. Clock speeds are actually where things start to get really interesting. First of all, despite the massive variance in temperatures, at full speed every one of these gets within spitting distance of the AK620. Also, with the curve optimizer modification, clock speeds tend to improve a bit too. But turn down those fans and the gap starts to widen a bit. Especially when comparing the L9A to the Shuriken, there's over a 200 megahertz gap between the two. So I guess that covers the 7600X. And moving on, we get to this guy, the 7700X. This is the most challenging CPU to cool, probably of this whole bunch in a lot of ways. And that's because that like the 7600X, it used a single CCD design, but it's been boosted to achieve higher frequencies. Well, it just gets to a hell of a lot higher temperatures at 100% and 50% fan speeds on every single one of these coolers. And that optimizer does absolutely positively nothing about it. And the Noctua, well, forget about it. I just wouldn't be comfortable using it to game on a 7700X unless you have some amazing airflow in your case. The IS55 is a bit better, but only at much higher fan speeds. The Big Shuriken is the only one here to get acceptable temperatures. I don't think the frame rates here should come as a surprise either, since the Ryzen 7000 series only tends to really cut back performance when CPUs hit 90 degrees or more. So the only cooler that really suffers is the Noctua. All the others get pretty much identical results as the AK620, so you aren't sacrificing much at all over high-end air cooling. And under an all-core workload, seriously, what else did you expect here? 95 degrees straight across the board, regardless of the CPU cooler or the PBO setting. But like I said before, temperatures aren't the big story these days, because even at 50% fan speed, there's actually some visible clock speed deltas, especially when you compare the L9A to the IS55 and the Shuriken, or those two versus the AK620. Pump things to higher fan speeds and the gap narrows a bit, but it's still there. So yeah, you're losing some top end performance when using these low profile coolers, some more than others, but a lot less than I'm sure a lot of you guys expected. So I guess we're starting to understand what kind of questions people have to start asking themselves when it comes to their low profile coolers and their small form factor systems. Are you running high level multi-core workloads or are you just intending on using it for light tasks and gaming and things like that? Once you have the answer to that question, I'm sure a lot of the other things will become 
clear, especially when it comes to the next two processors that I wanna talk about, and that is the 7900X and the 7950X. So starting with the 7900X, while it still pushes the best of the best ITX coolers above 70 degrees in gaming, the dual CCD nature of its design makes it easier to manage than the 7700X. So most coolers here are actually a few degrees better than on the 7700X, even with their fans spinning along at half speed. The only exception is the L9A, that just gets smoking hot. And again, reducing the curve optimizer really doesn't do anything to reduce temperatures since its effect is mostly felt in all core workloads. So here's the real head scratcher. Even though the 7900X was technically running hotter on the L9A than the 7700X, frame rates were impacted a bit less too. So it seems the higher end Ryzen 7000 CPUs might be a bit more forgiving when running at higher temperatures in lightly threaded scenarios. Otherwise though, all the coolers were pretty much carbon copies of one another here, regardless of temperatures. All core low temperatures on the other hand, yeah, this was a foregone conclusion, wasn't it? Welcome to Zen 4 everyone, but like I keep saying, the reality is a lot more nuanced. Even though all of these hit 95 degrees on the nose, there are massive clock speed differences between these coolers. Faster fan speeds show the exact same thing, and I also have to point out, for the first time in these tests, the L9A ends up running so hot, the processor goes below its base clock. On the other hand, the minus 10 setting does claw back some performance for the other two higher performing low profile coolers, but neither ends up at a completely optimal speed. And moving on to the 7950X in gaming, and let's just say you probably don't want to be using anything smaller than a big Shuriken 3. And even then, you'll need to be running it at almost full tilt to get under 80 degrees. I should also mention that for whatever reason, the L9A at minus 10 had a ton of stability issues, even in Windows. We're still looking into why this happened, but it was repeatable every single time. The ironic thing is the impact on overall gaming frame rates is minimal at most. I mean, sure, the IS55 and L9A get absolutely roasting hot, but their overall performance is still within 5% of the big shuriken. But at 50% fans, speed, you can see there's a bit bigger fall off compared to a higher end air cooler. Of course, since an all core load pushed these coolers to maximum on the 7900X, the same thing happens here. Everything, and I mean everything, gets pegged to 95 degrees. There's also a pretty wide clock speed gap between these coolers with slower fan speeds and a bit less when they're ramped up. Either way, it's pretty clear. While small form factor coolers can run the 7950X with an all core load, they can't do it without some significant performance penalties. All right, so that covers pretty much everything, but I didn't want to leave you with just that because I know some people are going to run these processors in eco mode, and that is exactly what I wanted to cover here. But look, I'm just gonna scratch the surface. Eco mode on the Ryzen 7000 series deserves a video all onto its own. So for this one, what I'm gonna do is take the lowest performing cooler here, which is the L9A, and set it to an eco mode of 65 watts. Let's start with gaming temperatures on the 7600X, and I should mention right away, the 65 watt in this eco mode denotes TDP, not actual power consumption. Power is actually kept somewhere around the 90 watt mark. So since the 7600X consumes about that when gaming, its temperatures don't really change at all but the 7700X does end up seeing temperatures cut back by between five and seven degrees depending on the fan speeds. And the benefits of eco mode are actually multiplied on dual CCD designs like the 7900X where it cuts back temperatures even more to the point where the L9A is actually usable. The 7950X does get a bit hotter, but still things are kept under 90 degrees with eco mode on. And that's one hell of an achievement when you consider what we started at. Frame rates on the 7600X don't actually change one iota, except for a very small overall increase with the fan running at 50%. On the other hand, there's the 7700X and eco mode consistently gave us higher frame rates than stock or the curve optimizer settings. That's probably because it was running so hot to begin with. The 7900X behaves differently too, since it seems to need more than the 90 watts allowed by eco mode to hit optimal frame rates. The 7950X falls into the same position too. I mean, look, the amount of performance being left on the table here is infinitesimal, and that's a no-brainer trade-off 
for much, much lower temperatures. But where eco mode really makes a difference both positively and negatively is in an all core workload on every single processor here, even the 7600X. And of course, as you move up to a hotter CPU like the 7700X, the differences become even more dramatic. By the time we get to the 7900X, there's a pretty insane temperature delta of almost 30 degrees when running the fans at 50%. The 7950X gets close to those numbers too, but there are some pretty major trade-offs here when it comes to performance. On a 7600X, this eco mode setting only hits frequencies by a minor amount compared to running stock, but things start to go downhill as we go higher in AMD's lineup, with the 7700X getting a pretty big cutdown. And remember, this processor normally runs closer to 5.2 gigahertz when it's not thermally limited. The 7900X fares even worse than that since there is a pretty massive clock speed reduction that comes tight at the hip to those great temperatures. The 7950X falls into this too since it needs a heck of a lot more than just 90 watts to maintain peak performance regardless of temperatures. Well I guess that's it and if this pretty long journey has taught me anything it is that yes it is absolutely positively possible to cool the Ryzen 7000 series with a small form factor cooler. The only thing that you're going to have to do is basically plan your build a lot more carefully than you used to with the Ryzen 5000 series or any other CPU that has come before. Because if it's gaming focused, then any cooler here is perfectly capable when it's paired up with the 7600X. The L9A, well, that's a borderline case though, because it proves that while a heatsink might be compatible with these CPUs, that doesn't necessarily mean you'll want to use it for cooling. But what about the other processors? Well, this is really where things become a little bit less clear cut and that additional build planning really needs Needs to come into play. First of all, this 7700X, you just need to treat it like a loaded gun very, very carefully because it can easily overwhelm every single one of these coolers if given the opportunity, even in gaming. Now this 7900 series, that I would recommend at the very bare minimum, a big Shuriken 3 Revision B. On the other hand, when you start hitting these processors with an all core load, all of that gets completely thrown out of the window. Because while there might not be much to worry about with regular air coolers and AIOs, most Ryzen 7000 series chips will simply overwhelm even the best small form factor coolers when you're hitting the system with an all core workload. But how many people outside us reviewers actually pound their ITX systems like that? I'm willing to bet not many. And when it comes to gaming specifically, eco mode is just such a good option for anyone looking into a small form factor system. It gives you just as good gaming results as stock, but much lower temperatures on Ryzen 7 and Ryzen 9 CPUs. Well guys, I guess that's it for this video and I hope that you learned as much from it as I did making it. If anything, this has taken a lot of my fears about building small form factor builds with the Ryzen 7000 series and sort of like, cast them aside. Yes, there's going to be some additional planning, but that's part of the fun. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you in the next one. Take care guys.